Okay. Okay, so let's see. So yeah, so, so I'm going to talk today um, about some work in progress. And it's just, just to emphasize from the beginning, this is a collaborative work with a group of Eric Matson here at the Fred Hutch and Paul Thomas um, at St. Jude and some collaborators at UW, Noah Simon and Dave, Dave Levine. And the general topic is how T cell receptors get made, um, you know, what influences the distribution of T cell receptors that we see when we sequence um, T, T cell receptors from the blood. And it's gonna have two parts. The first part is mostly published and will be longer. And then the second sort of half-baked part at the end, time permitting, will be some, uh, some work that's um, very much kind of in, in um, underway right now. Okay, so let's see here. So, so yeah, so, so the, the dream, you know, I think that many of us share who, who think a lot about re immune repertoires is that we can interpret the sequences of say T cell receptors or B cell receptors and, you know, use that information to detect or to aid in treatment of different things like infections or autoimmune disease, um, cancer. Um, you know, so, so my, my training is actually in math. And so one thing that's really appealing to me is just this whole concept of, of, of information being encoded. And this is a really appealing um, sort of a code, you know, it has these arcane names like TRBV3-1 and TRBJ1-1. And then there's some sequence, which, you know, has patterns, but, but it's not really clear how the sequence relates to the sort of functional information that's embedded in there. So this is something that I'm really interested in. Um, you know, how do we, um, how do we interpret immune repertoires? So the motivation for um, today's talk is largely that to do that effectively, we really need to understand the processes that generate them, um, you know, in, in healthy individuals and then, then, then also in, in disease contexts. So, so, right. So the first part, um, we're going to be looking at common genetic variants. So mostly SNP, single nucleotide polymorphisms that influence the um, process by which T cell receptors are generated. Okay, so um, so right, so, so I like to think about this in terms of the three-dimensional structure of the T cell receptor, um, which is what we're seeing here, um, spinning around. So here we have, yes, in green we have a class one MHC molecule, and that's binding to um, a peptide shown in magenta there, and then the T cell receptor is docking from sort of ver vertically, so it's coming down from the top there. And the T cell receptor is a heterodimer. So that means it has two different chains, although they're sequenced similar. Um, the alpha and beta chains, which here are shown, let's see, yellow, I guess, is the alpha chain. And then that sort of cyan color is the beta chain. So, um, so you know, you can see that the, the T cell receptor has places where it comes close to the MHC, places where it comes close to the peptide. Here I'm only showing in, um, in sort of stick representation the um, amino acids in the peptide, which is shown in, in magenta, and then in the, um, these long CDR3 loops, um, which are shown in a darker color of blue, and then that sort of pink or salmon or something color. And so um, these CDR3 loops are thought to be important determinants of the peptide specificity of the T cell uh, receptor. But I think it's also really important to realize that, you know, if we were to pause this video and um, follow, you know, the chain as it traces through one of these, um, as it traces through one of these, uh, let's see. So, you know, so for instance, the beta chain, if we follow, you know, from here, this is the N terminus of the variable domain. We come around here, come over here, come around here, come around here, come around here, come all the way down here. And all of that sequence is contributed by the V gene. So later on, we're going to talk about V genes and J genes and CDR3. And they're not really equal contributors to the specificity. You know, so, so the CDR3, which is something that many people tend to focus on because, you know, it's nice. It's, it's, a, it's, an, it's a sequence which fits into many algorithms for, um, you know, for analysis very easily. Still, um, the, the, the bulk of the variable domain is contributed by the V gene. And so that's everything up to, you know, somewhere around here, depending on the processes of trimming that I'll talk about later. So we have a bunch of stuff from the V gene. And then we have this CDR3 loop, which is, you know, depending on how we define the start and stop is kind of in here and makes a lot of the context of the peptide. Um, and the J gene is here, just this last little little the second half or, or so of the um, CDR3 and then this strand here heading up into the constant domain. So um, so that's sort of the structural um, context for these terms. 
V gene, you know, which really is the bulk of the variable domain, and then CDR3, which is this loop, which can be quite long and makes makes can make specificity determining contacts of the peptide, and then the J gene, you know, which which you can kind of think of as being important because it contributes sequence to the end of the CDR3. But you know, once you go back into the um, once you go back into the variable domain, you know, it just kind of wanders off and and leads to the constant domain. So so yeah, so that's I think um, what I wanted to say on this slide. Uh, let's see. Yeah. Okay. So, so yeah, so, so here again is the same thing. And at the, you know, the, 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 we're going to be talking more about amino acid sequences, and nucleotide sequences. And so the information that you need to describe, um, the amino acid sequence of a T cell receptor is shown inside this box. You basically need the, this identifier that ch tells you which V gene was chosen, an identifier, which tells you which J gene was chosen. Um, and then the sequence, the, the, the amino acid sequence of the CDR3. And since there's no somatic height permutation or changes, you know, at least um, we think that that's, that typically doesn't happen uh, with T cell receptors, um, all you need to describe the, the protein sequence itself is, is this information here inside the box. Um, those, you know, four gene identifiers and two CDR3 sequences. Okay, great. So that's the structural context. Um, all right, so let's see. So how do we make T cell receptors anyway? Um, so, and you know, um, full disclosure, I'm a mathematician by training, so I'm probably going to screw some of this stuff up. And my apologies to any immunologists who are in the audience. Um, so a lot of this action it happens in the thymus. So what happens is that developing T cells rearrange their genome in this stochastic process term VDJ recombination. And that leads to the uh, potential to express a, a vast diversity of TCR alpha and beta chains, typically um, one, sometimes two in-frame TCR alpha chains and, and, and usually one in-frame TCR beta chain per cell. Um, those T cells are selected you know, there, you have this random process. You can imagine it can go wrong in lots of different ways. Um, they're positively selected for at least some minimal interaction with self-peptide MHC, and they're negatively selected for binding too strongly to self-peptide MHC because that would be probably a bad thing. Um, and then let's see. Yeah, so so I think I'm going to talk more about um, the details of this process, but this is a nice graphic from, you know, um, this uh, very, very... Um, very, very nice paper from, from 2012 from um, uh, Mora and Walt Falchuk that, uh, showing how, you know, you have a sequencing read here. Uh, and then you have from that, and, and again, in most of the data that I'm going to be talking about, we'll be working from sequencing reads, which don't completely cover the, um, the whole chain. And so from that sequencing read, then you have this inference process by which you can figure out which J gene was, was likely used and which V gene was likely used. Um, in many cases, it's really hard to say which, which D gene in the middle here was used. Um, but you also have these processes by which nucleotides are deleted off the ends of the genes and then non-templated or, or you know, random nucleotides are inserted in the middle. Okay, great. So let's see here. So these are some nice slides that um, Maggie Russell, um, a grad student in, um, in Eric's group, who's the lead author on this um, paper made that I'm stealing here. So because we're gonna be talking about um, trimming and um, sort of mechanistic details of, of VDJ recombination, I think it's useful to, um, to go through these. So, so RAG recombinates, you, know, can, you can think of it as um, choosing the J and the D and the V uh, and it does this in a stepwise manner um, and making cuts in the genome to juxtapose them. And it leaves these, um, these, uh, these hairpin intermediates here, um, which are then opened by Artemis. And um, typically that's done offset from the end so that you get these complementary nucleotides um, folding over here. And those, those can contribute what are called P nucleotides to the, um, to the final rearranged read. Um, and then you have a process whereby the ends of the gene seg genes are trimmed back. So the end of the V, the end of the D, um, or the end of the D and the end of the J on the other side. Um, and then you have non-templated insertions. And then the, um, the ends are brought together there. And it's thought that in some cases, some, some microhomology can be important in establishing that junction. Uh, and then at the end of the day, you have a final, you know, you, you get stuff's filled in and you get a final rearranged pro 
uh, a final rearranged gene. And so that at the end of the day, you go from the V through potentially some part of the D that might be left over, although it's often trimmed quite far back, and then the J. And that sequence from the conserved cysteine at the end of the V to what uh, typically a phenylalanine um, at, in the J, that's the CDR3 region. And there's a, a lot of diversity introduced by this process of N insertion, but also by the variability of the trimming. Okay, great. Uh, and again, interrupt me if, 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 if I'm going to, if I'm just saying things that don't make any sense. Okay, so the basis for this um, first part of the talk is um, a, a really beautiful data set of 400 essentially healthy donors, um, and for which we have for each individual a deep TCR beta repertoire. And so that's going to be 400 times repertoires that are about 250,000 unique TCR sequences. And then we also have for all those individuals genome-wide SNP genotyping, so 400 by 35 million SNPs. And so that, that's 35 million final SNPs that we get. Some of those were on the arrays, some of those were imputed, um, but we're, we're working with this matrix of 400 by 35 million um, SNPs. And, and, and the premise is we're going to try and figure out which of those SNPs influence the process of EDJ recombination. Okay, and so the four things that we're going to look at in this stochastic process, you know, that we're going to convert into numbers that we can then do some a, a genome-wide association analysis with, are um, the choice of the V beta, the choice of the J beta, um, the extent of tr trimming off the ends uh, of the genes, and then the number of non-templated nucleotides that are inserted. And the raw data looks kind of like what we're looking, what's shown over here on the right. We have like V gene identifiers, we have J gene identifiers, and then we have nucleotides um, that we can try and um, process to infer what the, the, the most likely rearrangement scenario was. And so you can imagine we could go, if we had the set of 250,000 of these, we could go through and we could count how many times TRBV19 you know, might occur here. And that'll give us some number for each patient. And we could see, are there any SNPs that influence that number, the frequency of usage of that gene. Okay, so there's one other really important thing that we need to know about the data. And that's this fact that when we, um, you know, so T cells, they're going through the stochastic rearrangement process in the thymus. And um, as you can imagine, if it's, you're inserting random numbers of nucleotides and deleting random number of nucleotides, many times the V and the J might not be um, put into the, the correct, read, the same reading frame. Um, you could also put in a stop codon. And so in, in many cases, that stochastic process leads to a, a non-functional T cell receptor. Um, so that cell has a chance then to rearrange um, on the other, um, you know, um, rearrange the other chromosome. And so, um, so if that's, that second rearrangement is successful, then that first failed rearrangement will remain um, and that will be sequenced or with some frequency that will be sequenced um, in this process. And so what that means is that the data that we get includes sequences that don't necessarily make any sense for real T, T cell receptors, right? They might be sequences in which the V and the J are not in the same frame, or they might be sequences in which there's a stop code on the middle of the CDR3. And so what we can infer about those is that they are you know, well, they're either sequencing errors, and obviously that can happen, um, but the majority of them, the vast majority of them are these failed rearrangements that were then um, succeeded by a successful rearrangement in the same cell. And since we were, we are able to sequence those. The nice thing about these, and this has been um, recognized for a while now, is that it, it, in principle, they, um, they give us a view of the VDJ recombination process that is less influenced by selection, you know, either positive or negative thymic selection or any kind of peripheral selection. And so if we're really interested in processes, which we are to some extent in this first part of the talk that are happening in the thymus in the process of rearrangement, then these out of frame sequences or these, these non-productive sequences um, might give us a clearer picture of that because they haven't been selected at all for functionality. Okay, so that's just something when I talk about non-productives or out of frames, I'm talking about these sequences that we're able to get because they're in a cell that also has a, a functional TCR. Okay, so the, the, the general approach here is a GWA. So it's a genome-wide association study um, where we get numerical features from the T cell receptor repertoires, and then we, we, we run them against our matrix, our 400 by 35 million matrix. Um, and the one subtle thing that we have to do is subtract out some population structure that's present 
in the um, in the um, in the cohort, and we do that using some pretty standard um, uh, tools from from obviously GWAS. There's 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 a deep literature there, and and, and lots of um, lots of great um, work uh, about how we can subtract out things that might be varying. Um, just with ancestry or along with ancestry. And so anyway, so, so what we do is we have, in addition to just doing the most straightforward possible, every possible SNP versus the numerical features, um, we have um, principal components that are defined to reflect um, the, the ancestry, the primary ancestry contributions. And so for each donor, we get a matrix, we, we get, you know, nine numbers, which are the, the ancestry principal components. And we put those into the, um, the regression when we're fitting a feature, a repertoire feature against a SNP. And that allows the, us to subtract out things that might be just varying with ancestry. Okay, anyway, so that's, that's a detail for, for people who, are, who think about um, GWAS studies on, on a daily basis. Okay, so let's talk about choice of the V beta gene. So, so this is the kind of data that we get. Um, we get for every single SNP here, and I'm not showing them all, I'm just showing ones that have um, a p-value above, you know, more significant than say 10 to the minus three or 10 to the minus four or something like that, um, just because otherwise the plot has too many points and it takes a while to make. Um, so what this is showing is uh, across the x-axis, all of the SNPs are arrayed by genomic location, you know, chromosome one, chromosome two, chromosome three, along like that. Um, and then each different color, which obviously there are too many of them for this, and there's no real way of discriminating them, but this is, each different color is one of the numerical features. In this case, it's the frequency of the usage of a given V gene. And so what we can see here, and I apologize, there's all sorts of overplotting, so we don't necessarily, we're not going to be able to go back and infer which V gene necessarily each of these is. Um, also, the colors are kind of lame. But anyway, what we can see here is when we look at this so-called Manhattan plot of p-value on the y-axis, so association p-value versus SNP on the x-axis, we see these peaks. So there's a peak here, and um, that's at the MHC locus. And then there's another peak here over at the TCR beta locus. And those are two things that make a lot of sense. So the TCR beta locus makes sense because um, there are, uh, it's, it's known that there are sequence differences between individuals at the TCR beta locus that can influence the frequency with which different um, V genes are chosen. And you know, so an example is um, when RAG um, is doing this process of selecting the V genes, you know, um, there are these signal sequences, these RSS sequences that um, that are, are used and there's actually variation in the sequence of those in some cases. There's also um, variation in um, promoter sequences that, that influence how open the, the, the genome is in different places. So anyway, so, so this peak here above TCRB, that's the cis variation that influences the choice of the V-beta gene. This over here is trans variation, so it's on a different chromosome, so it's far away, um, but it's still influencing the choice of the V-gene. And, um, and yet at the MHC, this makes sense because the MHC, that's, if you remember from that um, little spinning movie at the beginning, that, that, the, that's where the sequence variation in the green protein, which, which was binding to the um, peptide and, and presenting it to the TCR, that's where that's present, um, is in the MHC locus. And if you remember from that movie, there are actually quite a few contacts between the V gene um, when you look across, say, all solved crystal structures of T cell receptor peptide MHC complexes, there are quite a few contacts between the V gene and the MHC. And so it sort of is reasonable or at least plausible that um, different people who have different um, MHC, um, say different HLA alleles or HLA B alleles, um, they might use in their functional repertoire um, different V genes with different frequencies. And what's neat in this data set is we can actually split out the functional, which we're, and, and here we're inferring that the inframes or the, the ones that don't have a stop code on where, where V and J are in frame, that those are functional. Um, we can do the analysis just on the functional sequences and, and also then just on the non-functional or non-productive sequences. And what's cool is when we look at the non-functional or non-productive sequences, this trans association with MHC goes away completely. And so that's here, there, there's no peak here, but there's a peak here. And yet the cis variation, which we think is intrinsic to the process of VGA recombination is present in both cases. Um, there's also this interesting signal out here, which is a little more pronounced in the, um, 
in the non-productive sequences, which we don't really understand at all. This was also noted in a, there was a previous study from the Pritchard lab, which was looking at bulk RNA-seq and inferring um, B gene usage from that. And they also saw this interesting signal out here for, for a specific B gene. So that's, um, there are actually a few, um, uh, you know, zinc fingers, potential, um, you know, transcriptional regulators out there, but, but, but we don't really understand that. Okay, great. So you can then zoom in just to make this even more concrete. We can look at this um, cis variation. So this is the variation right around the TCR beta locus um, that influences um, that influences the usage of the different B genes. And so I don't know. This is a very busy plot, but I think it's just nice to see what this stuff looks like when you zoom in up close. And so, so the way this works is that all of these purple sideways triangles are um, SNPs that influence the usage of the purple sideways triangle, this TCR BV28, so that particular B gene. And so you can see there are a bunch of them. And of course, what that really means is that, you know, the way these SNPs are in, um, they're in LD, so they, they, they are inherited together. Really close SNPs will tend to be inherited together. And so it's hard to know from all of these associated SNPs necessarily, which might be the one that's actually influencing the usage. But you can kind of see that there is, that it increases in this direction to some extent. And I've marked down here the actual genomic location of that, of TCRPV28. And so that's, this is the kind of pattern that you often see in, um, in, you know, it, 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 I mean, not, not that I'm an expert in it, but in these association studies, you'll have many SNPs that are nearby, or potentially many SNPs that are nearby that are all associated with some feature, and you don't necessarily know which the functional one is. Um, but yeah, and so you can see some of these are quite significant. Um, yeah, I mean, we're, it's not super important to go into the details, but that's just what it looks like if you zoom into that funny compressed peak that we had on the previous, um, the, the previous slide. Okay, so let's talk about the other sort of combinatorial diversity that goes into TCR repertoires, and that's the J, J gene choice. Um, so this is the Manhattan plot for J gene choice. And here we see that there is no peak over MHC. And so this is, this is um, I can't actually remember whether this is, um, I, this is, this is the, I mean, this is certainly the productives. I just can't remember whether it's all or whether it's productives only, but anyway, let's, let's just pretend that it's the productives. Um, uh, there's no, we don't see any influence of MHC on the choice of the J gene. And um, that's compatible with what we saw in the structure, which was that it seemed like most of the contacts between MHC and TCR were um, through the V gene. And so that's at least, um, it's at least reasonable that we don't see um, that we don't see a strong association with JG usage. Okay, so let's look at this um, a feature that really contributes a lot of diversity to the repertoire, and that's the non-templated nucleotide insertion. So that's again these sequences here in this nice um, image from that the, that PNAS paper, the Marugan paper. Um, so 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 right. So we've got the, the nucleotides that were trimmed off, and then we have these new nucleotides that, when we're analyzing our read, we don't see them matching to any nucleotide in the J or the D or the V, and so we infer that these are um, inserted nucleotides. So what we're doing here is we're just sort of counting the total number, and that's our numerical feature. And so this is um, this is a plot showing this is another Manhattan plot, and here the associations are not as strong as for V gene usage, and here as well. Um, this is a case where there's actually some variation that's associated with ancestry. And so when we did this analysis without using the, um, without using the principal components to kind of subtract out the ancestry effect, um, we saw an even taller peak here um, at this really magical locus here that I'll talk about in a second. But we also saw other seemingly significant peaks throughout the genome. And that was a little bit weird. Uh, but then when we, um, when we subtracted out the variation uh, using this PCA method that seemed to be associated with ancestry, then we then we really don't see anything that peaks above um, our, our um, genome-wide significance threshold here, except this peak here. Um, and so that's in um, that's right at this um, locus DNTT, which codes for TDT, which is the enzyme primarily responsible for inserting the end nucleotide. So this is kind of like if you had, you know, if you if you picked a re VDJ recombination expert and you told them they had only one guess as to which would be um, the gene that would influence the number of non-templated um, nucleotide insertions, you know, they would all say 
it's it's TDT, um, or at least many of them would anyway. Um, this is sort of you know the, this is the top candidate gene. So that was really exciting. I mean, not necessarily super novel. And I should say that from in previous studies, it had been noted that there seemed to be some inter-individual variation in the number of non-templated nucleotide insertions. And so there's it's reasonable to have expected that there might be this genetic component. And so, but here we have the actual, we can go in and actually look at the actual SNPs that we see. And then and we're, we're looking now to see whether any of them might be EQTLs, might be functional SNPs, just what the, what the influence might be. Um, so that's N insertions. And like I said there, it's a little murky because as you saw, there's not a lot, they didn't really peak very far above the sigma mix threshold. One that was even, that was, that was more satisfying um, and in some ways a little more surprising was um, for trimming. So here we're looking at the extent of deletion from the ends of the genes. Okay, and so, so trimming is a really interesting feature. Uh, this is another thing I like about that Marugan paper um, is just, the picture of what 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 the trimming looks like. Um, so so yes. Yeah, so, so here we're just looking at. Um, let's see what I can't really remember what we're looking at here. Oh yeah. So so no yeah. So what this is showing is for um, for different common J and V genes. This is showing the frequency with which a given um, extent of trimming is present. So it's like we take all the TRBV five one reads the reads that use that, and we see how many of them are, are um, have zero nucleotides trimmed, how many of them have one nucleotide trimmed, how many of them have two, three, four, and so on like that. And so we, and then each of these different lines that are kind of, or these different traces here that are largely superimposed, those are different individuals. So what's neat is that you can see that the different individuals are pretty similar to one another, and that the different genes, you know, they really have these very, very stereotyped and distinct patterns of trimming. You know, so this one goes down up, there's, there's this little zigzaggy here, you know, some of them have these sharp peaks. Um, yeah, so that's what the trimming looks like when we look just, just in the simplest possible manner across, um, across all the reads using given gene across multiple individuals. This is not all the individuals we have in the cohort. I think this is 10 or 20, uh, 20, yeah. Um, so, so yeah, it's kind of fun to think about what influences these patterns, right? I mean, obviously what's different between these different genes or one thing that's different is that is the terminal nucleotide sequence at, at the end of the gene. And so it's likely that the, 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 the big factor here is that that sequence, you know, can be trimmed, um, to different extents with, 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 with a different um, degree of ease. Um, you know, so for instance, it had been noted that AT rich sequences tend to be trimmed further back than GC rich sequences. And so obviously those things can vary between the different genes, but there's just a lot of spikiness to these patterns too, which is something that we're, we're looking at now, um, trying to understand better what kinds of factors influence that. Okay, but anyway, so that's what you get if you just look at the data. I mean, not, you know, not a huge amount of variation, inter-individual variation, like I said. Um, so just to get a bit more insight into this, um, we, we, what we did is we, we just took the most common genes and we took their trimming distribution, so just what we were looking at on the previous slide, and we just concatenated them to make, like, for each person, a vector, um, which was, you know, how far TRBV5-1 was trimmed, one, 0, 1, 2, 3, and then TBV6-5, we just stuck them all together. So then for each person, we have this vector of numbers, and we can do PCA on that um, to see what, what are the largest um, sources, you know, the, 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 the directions of, very, uh, of greatest variation when we look at just the raw trimming data. What's kind of neat is that if you look at the way the variance, um, sort of at the explained variance for the different principal components, you can see that the first principal component explains a lot of variance, and then things really just drop down after that. Okay, so what is this first principal component of trimming variation? Um, we can see it colored here. So these are, so the, the way, what this is showing is that this, this direction of greatest variation in, in, in trimming is, um, you know, uh, let's see, sorry. I, I don't know if you can see my pointer, but 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 here um, it's sort of it's a direction which would correspond to less trimming, uh, less at zero and one and more at two at three. And this one in this gene is less at zero, one, two, three, four, five, and then more at six, seven, eight, nine, ten. And so you can see in general, all of the genes pretty much have this pattern that this principal axis of variation is less short trimming, more long trimming. Um, yeah. Yeah, so, so, so you might say in general that that's just variation in the total extent of trimming that is not really super gene specific.
And so this gave us some hope that there might be some signal, there might be some important inter-individual variation in extent of trimming. And then of course you can just do the analysis, which you know you might argue I should have just started with this, but, but I do kind of like seeing the raw trimming distributions. I think it's really interesting. Um, so right, so when we do a, a, an analysis of trimming, so we, we look for single nucleotide polymorphism that influences the extent of, of, of trimming. This is the Manhattan plot that we first that we first got. And so you can see what's what we see a strong, um, we see a tall peak here. And that happens to be right in and around the, um, the gene that codes for the Artemis protein. And then we see another peak here, which is um, at TCRB, the TCR beta locus. So this is cis variation that's influencing trimming. And then we see we have another peak here at the MHC. So Artemis, super exciting for us to, to find that as, 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 as a very strong peak because again, Artemis had been implicated in, in, in opening those hairpins um, and it was thought that Artemis was likely involved in, in trimming. Um, and um, this cis variation also makes sense because if you change the terminal sequence of the genes, it's not unreasonable that that stereotype patterns might, that those patterns might change as well. Um, and then um, MHC was honestly a, a bit of a surprise um, because that's clearly sort of a, uh, well, yeah, we weren't really clear why the, why the MHC would be influencing the extent of trimming. Um, but Maggie had a really good idea, which is that, um, well, we know that the MHC influences V gene choice. And we saw on two slides earlier that different V genes are trimmed to different extents, right? They each have their own stereotype pattern of, of trimming. And so, so if you're changing the distribution of V genes through the MHC variation, then that could influence this aggregate trimming statistic that you've created, right? And so what, what Maggie did was to create with, with the help of Noah Simon at UW, a model in which we were able to factor out any variation in V gene choice and just look at trimming, sort of accounting for any kind of variation in VG choice. And what was really neat is that with that model, um, this variation at MHC completely went away. So it was an indirect effect of VG choice. And so what we're left with is, again, this, this strong peak here at, at Artemis. This is the gene DCLR-E1C. And then it, again, cis variation at, at TCR beta. So, so that's, that's cool. And so you can see um, that, that, that you actually have a nice dose uh, response, if you will, affect as you go from the, the common genotype here, which is shown in green in all these plots, um, to a genotype which has here one, you know, with this is the um, heterozygote uh, for, for the strongest SNP that influences trimming, and then this is the homozygote. What we're showing here is the CDF, the trimming CDF, but we're subtracting out the most common allele. So we can see that if you're homozygous for this variant, you have less short trimming and then in your cdf you kind of catch up um here at, at higher trim for this j gene and you can see it's kind of the same deal for for these different j and v genes modulo some noise for for probably the lower count um genes so anyway so there is you know there's variation and it seems to be uh, it seems to make sense in terms of um in terms of the homozygote heterozygote and this is this is just another way of looking that day at, at that data variation in total trimming um, in these two independent cohorts from Paul Thomas. So what was neat is to see that as we went from the, um, you know, the, the common, the major allele, the heterozygote to the minor allele, we see um, in all cases, an increase in trimming. Uh, and, and, and that's true on the alpha chain as well as the beta chain. So, so yeah, okay, so that was the first part. And um, which I said was going to be longer anyway, and and I think I am really close to the end of my time. So I think that what I should do here um, is um, is just kind of you know maybe I'll just kind of give you let's see what should I do? I have three to four minutes left. Um, uh, I think. Oh yeah. You, Are there you, any questions about part one? Are you trying to squeeze in uh, your next part in three minutes? That's what I'm. Asking. Yes, I'm going to squeeze all. 50 slides that I have. No, I'm just teasing. I'm just teasing. Yeah. Yeah. I'm just teasing. Um, yeah. No, no, no. I, I think, I think I'm going to stop now. <laughs> yeah. Um, but, but unless you, what are you going to suggest? No, I, I was suggesting that you can go on until, you know, let's say uh, five minutes uh, before the hour, you know, because you know. Ah, okay. Well, I'll, 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 I'll let's, I'll, I'll do a compromise. I'll go, but I will go a little bit faster. And then, um, yeah. And then, then I, but I'll, I'll, I'll definitely leave some time for questions. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Um, because this, I only have about three or four slides here. So, 
So right, and this is more sort of conceptual and intuitive than it is like real um, data. What, what I'm really excited about is, um, is the repertoire data that we have now. Um, and so obviously, as, as you all know, we have lots of um, mostly single chain repertoire data um, from bulk TCR beta sequencing. Um, but we also have increasingly um, exciting repertoire data from single cell studies. And you know, I, 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 I'm just still kind of amazed at how much single cell data um, on T cells there is out there. Uh, and I think there were some very big um, COVID cohorts, um, which included you know, both healthy controls and also um, COVID patients. But um, collectively, we have now single cell data, single cell um, data, which includes alpha beta paired um, chain data and gene expression for well over a thousand individuals in these publicly available um, cohorts. You know, it's a bit of a nuisance downloading it all and standardizing it, and and, and that's a fiddly thing that we're sort of doing. Um, but but there's a ton of this data, and it's really exciting data for the following reasons. I think um, one is that it's paired alpha beta data, and I think many of you know that when you look across um, T cells and T cell receptors that are specific for different epitopes. It's not always the case that the beta chain is doing most of the work, if you will, or at least that the beta chain is where there are the strongest sequence signals. But often there are very strong sequence signals on the alpha chain. If you can just look, even look at mates, mate cells, for instance, and, and it's really the alpha chain that is highly convergent there. Um, and um, maybe that's a special case, but then certainly you look at other ep sort of canonical epitope specific repertoires. Many of them are alpha, alpha chain dominated. And so, so I think A, this data, which again is, you know, there are many between one and 2 million TCRs now that we can get where we have the paired alpha beta. The other really fun thing is that we have the gene expression data as well for each cell um, contributing to the clonotypes with those different TCRs. And so I just think that this is a, a, a really super amazing, um, resource. Uh, and and it's, like I said, a bit of a nuisance to work with. And so we're trying to get stuff cleaned up and make it make it easier for, for other people to use. Um, because it's, again, they're big downloads and, and it's pretty heterogeneous how the, the TCRs are represented. And so that's, I know, something that you all know a lot about trying to standardize that process. I think there's just um, really wonderful data here. So this, again, is single cell data that includes um, a lot of it done with the 10x, 10x um, genomics VDJ uh, kit. So, um, so right. So what we've been trying to do is um, use this data to look at um, convergent T cell receptor motifs. You know, so these are um, these might be, for instance, across many different people who are CMV positive, they have a response to the NLV, a particular, and, and who are also AO201 positive, say they, they will tend to have TCRs with similar sequence features. And so we would like to be able to, across this, say, you know, 1,200, 1,300 donors, um, you know, 1.6 million TCRs or something, we'd like to be able to detect convergence. So, so not, oh, not public TCRs, because at the pair chain level, um, that's pretty rare, but um, at least similar TCRs sequences across those individuals. Because I think that's, that's again, toward this goal of interpreting repertoires, um, this convergent selection across multiple individuals of T cell receptors, of similar T cell receptor sequences, is kind of powerful evidence for functionality. And in the context of this, this um, single cell data where we have, for instance, transcripts from the HLA and we can infer MHC and we have all this other interesting stuff that we know about each cell. It's a really neat, um, it's a really neat, uh, neat thing. We can try and figure out the functionality of these T cells potentially. So, so yeah, so the goal is identify public motifs that occur across individuals. And um, the way we're gonna do that, since these are paired chains and we can't really assume a identity at the paired chain level, um, that's too restrictive. We need to have a way of accounting for the similarity between two paired chain T cell receptors. And so we're using a metric or a measure called um, TCR DIST that we developed with Paul Thomas a few years ago. And um, it's basically just a sequence distance uh, between the CDR loops, the CDR1, CDR2, CDR3, and it's a bit weighted by um, amino acid similarity. It, 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 as opposed to our exact identity, but it's essentially a sequence distance. Okay, so, so what we do is first we, we turn that sequence distance 
into a probability, which is just, you know, we just, we figure out a way of saying, what are the odds of seeing that degree of similarity between these two alpha beta TCRs? And I think this is important because you, you, you see the same extent of similarity between two very, two TCRs that are very close to germline. And it's somehow a bit less significant than the same extent of, of similarity, the same number of mismatches between two CCRs that are very far from germline and have long C dark threes. This is something that you know, many people have recognized. So, but the bottom line is we get a distance between two TCRs and we can attach to that a, a, a probability. And so then we can we can follow um, um, Terry Mora and Alex Walchuk and 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 um, the folks at VDJ Tools and their and the, or the TCR Net. This idea of figuring out um, um, when does a TCR have more neighbors than we would expect. And so here, um, there's this nice Alice paper or Alice method, um, and we're just basically using that. With, with the differences be that instead of um, just a straight up Hamming distance and re restricting to identical um, gene segments, um, we're using this TCR dist measure so we can have variation in the gene segments and, um, and we get a little bit of um, nucleotide or amino acid similarity as well as identity. Um, but it, the concept is the same, which is that we have a central TCR, we choose some radius around there, we see how many um, T cell receptors are within that radius in say our set of 45 million or no, of, of 1.5 million TCRs across all these individuals. Um, and then we, we need to know, are we surprised by how many neighbors that TCR has? And there the idea is that we need some background model for generating TCRs nearby. And I don't need to go into the details here. Okay, cool. So, so what is the data, what does this look like when you, um, when you do this process of looking for TCRs that have more neighbors than you'd expect by chance um, in this big single cell data set, which is formed from you know, merging, say, 45 different cohorts. Um, yeah, so this is th these are the largest convergent clusters that we see across the, the, those, those individuals. And so what I'm showing here is um, sort of a CDR3 alpha and CDR3 beta sequence logo. And then this is the V and J and V and J gene usage shown again, sort of in logo format. And so we can see this is the largest um, of these clusters here. It has, it, the details aren't important, but this has got 20,000 different clonotypes when we look across all these individuals. Um, so that's a really big convergent TCR cluster. And of course, this is TRAV1-2, TRAG33. These are just mate cells. So this is like the positive control for convergent TCRs across um, individuals. So that's, you know, that's good. I guess we would want that probably to be at the top. Um, what I'm showing over here on the right-hand side is um, the expression of a few different marker genes um, in the cells that are contributing to this convergent TCR cluster. And so we can see, for instance, this first row is CD4, then CD8 alpha, CD8 beta, KLRB1 um, and ZBTV16. So these two are sort of often found in um, these invariant T cell um, T cells, and we can see indeed that um, KLRB1 is very high in the mates, and this ZBTV16 is also very high. And then we have you know some markers of um, activation or, or of um, proliferation, KS67, TIMS, then we've got CCR7 and cell, we've got some, some granzymes. Anyway, so we have just, you know, this again, just to, just kind of to convey how rich this data is. We have, you know, we, we don't, we have like 30,000 of these numbers for each cell. Um, of course, many of them are zero, but, um, but the, here I'm just focusing on, you know, 15 or 20. So, so this is the transcriptional profile at these marker genes of the T cells that went into forming this convergent TCR cluster. And um, then here's the second biggest one, which is dropped from 20,000 down to 1,000 clonotypes across these individuals. And this is TRAV10, TRAG18, TRBB25. And so that's, those are these invariant NKT cells. So that's, that's another positive control, if you will, um, but nice to see. And there again, you see not, not great CD, CD4, CD8 expression, but this ZBTB16 and this PLZF or Z, yeah, sorry, sorry, KLRB1, ZBT. So yeah, sort of invariant. Okay, so what's the next one? Now that we have all the positive controls out of the way, um, we've got TRAV27, TRAG42, TRBV19, this RS motif. So this is the um, M158, AO2 restricted flu, you know, response. So this is um, 
this that 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 everybody if you're if you're developing a predictor of TCR specificity, this is what you want to you want to you know benchmark your method on because it has a super canonical um, repertoire. And so maybe it's not surprising that we then see this as as our top hit here. Um, we see strong CD8. So this is as as expected. This is a CD8 response. Um, and then we see some, some, you know, this is then some picture of the profile, uh, transcriptional profile of the cells contributing to this convergent cluster. Um, and so anyway, so that's another, you know, maybe you'd say that was a positive control too. So then, but then you can imagine like we can go down this list and it's very long. There's, um, I think 700 in here, uh, convergent clusters with at least 10 clonotypes. And so I'll just highlight a couple of other interesting ones. Um, this one here, so we have, we have some CD, more more CD fours here. Um, these three. This one is a C, another CD eight one. Strong CD eight alpha CD eight beta. Um, and this is this trav five, trav thirty one, um, BB twenty one. So this is um, this is the the this is the BMLF one. This is an EBV uh, BMLF one um, epitope. And so. Um, yeah. Anyway, I think I, I think I, I'm I'm basically going to stop here. But 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 just this is another one here. This is um this is one that's a C. This is an HLAC restricted um, CMV uh, response here. And I was gonna I could tell a long story about how granzyme K is higher in the EBV ones and granzyme H is higher in the C, C, CMV ones. But then we have some some more CD4s here that have kind of high. This is some um, FOXP3 um, at least higher than the other one. So maybe there's some regulatory stuff going on. Anyway, so this is just a really rich data set. Oh yeah, there's there's one other one that I want to talk about, which is like this one here. This one is, um, this is COVID here. So this is um, a, a class two, so you can see it's strong CD4. This is a, an epitope, um, this is a, a known COVID class two response um, that was just published on recently. And there's one more, and you can see because of these cohorts, this is a strong proliferation. We see KI67 there um, because of the way these cohorts are timed. So anyway, so that's the end of that. Um, I have more silly slides here, but um, but yeah. So the conclusions are, um, we do see common genetic variants that influence VDJ recombination. Um, we can see that in terms of gene usage, in terms of nucleotide insertion, although it's it's a little bit weak, and then very strongly in terms of nucle extent of nucleotide trimming, and with potentially some interesting mechanistic um, consequences of that 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 role for Artemis um, in that nucleotide trimming process. Um, then the, the point that I wanted to make, which was really just sort of to convey this sense that this paired um, single cell, the paired TCR so that we get from single cell data um, are a really powerful um, input to these algorithms for detecting TCR convergence. Um, and I think that this TCR dist, which is you know just one way of measuring um, distance between TCRs, I really think it shines on this paired data because there are you know V gene differences. You know it's not just you know it's not just identity plus hamming. There's there's important things that one can do there when you account for differences between V genes. And um, yeah, so I'm just really excited in the, in the coming years as as we generate more of this data. Um, I think there's a lot that we can learn about T cells and uh, convergence of T cell receptors and the phenotypes of them. So yeah, so that's it. So just to acknowledge again, Maggie, who's the student who led the um, the um, the GWAS work with um, Eric, Dave, and Noah, and then Paul and and um, Stefan at St. Jude, um, who I've been working with um, on the um, on the sort of you know the the um, single cell stuff, and um, so the NIH for for support, and um, yeah, and that maybe I'll just stop here and see if we have any questions. And sorry, sorry, I went a, a little bit long. I apologize. Uh, you don't have to apologize for the beautiful talk. Thank you very much, Phil. Okay, okay. Uh, I see that people started to uh, ask questions in, in the chat. I will, I will start with, uh, I mean, feel free to ask more questions or to raise your hand if you want. Um, I'll start with a simple question about the trimming. Um, you show that it's very different between the different uh, V genes. Uh, does it differ between alleles of the same V gene? If you have like different individuals with different alleles, how does the trimming profile change? Yes, it, it yes, changed? absolutely. It, it is it, it is different. It, it can be different between different alleles. And I think that's one source of the cis signal that we see, um, you know, when we look at um, this, uh, the, the GWAS for trimming is, yeah, that these, you know, cis coding variation in the VLEs themselves 
in the VGs themselves, that's kind of what defines these V alleles, at least for the ones where, where we, you know, and I realized that the TCR locus has not been extend, you know, conclusively mapped in all the V genes identified and or, or the alleles identified. And that's a really super interesting and important area. But yes, I think that's absolutely correct. And we have some, you know, we've looked at some examples of that. Yes, you can have different alleles which have different um, trimming um, distributions by virtue of that allelic variation. Yeah, yeah, that's a good, that's an important point. All right, thank you. Another one is like, I mean, you show this uh, LD plot, uh, the linkage disequilibrium, but it's with a quantitative uh, uh, feature, right? The, the level of expression of each V. Yeah, gene, that right? one I showed, that's that, you're right, that that's what that was, yeah. So can you say also something about the directionality of, of the effect of each of these SNPs on the expression of each of these genes? And can you, from this, Produce some kind of a generative a model to 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 reflect the VGN distribution in the repertoire. Yes, yes, it, that's a really wonderful point. I mean, yes, I think you're right that when we see the p-value, we don't convey with that this directionality, but it absolutely would be directional. And um, yes, I mean, I think in these cases where there's a block that are you know, in strong LD, that there is some effect of you know, maybe the, the, the primary driver, and that effect might be to increase or decrease relative to sort of the, the, the major allele, say. Um, and, um, and yeah, I, it would be, I, I need to think about how to, um, how to convey that information as well. Um, that's, a really, that's a really neat point. Yeah, because some of them, you know, for instance, there is variation involving, there's a region that's deleted. Um, it's a pretty common deletion with you know whatever it is TRBV three dash two and four dash three and six dash I can't really remember six dash two anyway there's that there's that and so there obviously there's variation that's like just you just see that those drop in people with that um, so as to making a predictor you know I think you're right that the whole motivation is we want to be able to for instance in the long run we want to be able to interpret differences in repertoires. Um, in terms of changes in some important health-related um, phenotype. And to do that, we kind of need to be able to subtract out differences that are coming from this um, genetic variation. So yes, I think you're right that the one goal would be to, if we're given a person's um, you know, TCRB um, genotype, um, uh, we, we would be able to make a, a, a personal, a specific predictor, predict, predictor of their um, V gene usage say that we could then use as sort of our background or null model, um, you know, uh, uh, to, to, to understand what might be important differences. Um, yeah, yeah. Thanks. Uh, I see that uh, Encarnita raised her hand, so please uh, ask, and then we have one, one more question here. Yes, thank you, Goris. Thank you, Philip, for uh, this nice talk and presentation and this work, which is amazing. I, I have two questions. Uh, the first one, so more on the, um, the first part of your talk. Um, so you've been working with this immersion data, right? Yes. Uh, it's total blood. Yes. Which means you are analyzing the TCRB from CD4 and CD8. And we know, or at least people observe, that there, the usage of the different Vs are different. Have yes. you seen, or can you, or do you have any other data set that could make the link between uh, this uh, MHC uh, linkage disequilibrium that you, you found and that you uh, showed, yes? uh depending on the cell subset um yes yes that's a wonderful question yes because we are we do see yeah we're, we're looking at a mix and so we see associations we see changes in bg usage with both class one class two alleles and 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 you know and that's all sort of murky and superimposed mm. yeah um yes i think so for instance i think paul thomas his group has some um data where they on, on sorted um cd4s and cd8s and so it's it's the data set, and I think one of those data sets was published in the context of, of, of this study that I talked about because it was a sort of a validation cohort that we used. And so there, um, that data is not as deep. And so it's it's a little bit hard, but there you do see what you would expect, which is that the HLA associations are sort of class specific in the way that you would hope. So that, um, yeah, so, so that you see in the CD8s, when you look at VGN usage in the CD8s, you see um, primarily 
class one associations. Um, but there again, I think that the depth of the data is not as great as the Emerson. Mm. And so, um, so it's a little bit harder to see those things. Okay. Yeah, yeah. And the second question is, so again, you, what, your observation are based on blood uh, repertoires. Yeah. So post -select, selected repertoires and uh, further post selected because maybe there is some immune responses and so on and so yeah. forth. Uh, what would be your um, your uh, hypothesis or or, or guess uh, whether this uh, linkage disequilibrium might also be associated to the generation of the repertoire? So uh, before the selection and, and and is there something some interconnection? So we know those genes appears during the evolution at the same time so they are tightly linked uh, so how could it work at the selection level the generation level in the thymus yeah we don't really see when we look at the non-productives as sort of our proxy of you know mm -hmm. pre um and i know that's an, a very imperfect but we don't see mhc effects for instance we don't really see any, okay. I mean, with one exception, we don't see any trans effects when we look in the um, region usage in the non-productive sequences. So that's sort of the, that's, yeah, but it's, I think if we could have larger cohorts of, of true um, um, thymic TCRs of various kinds, I think that would be wonderful. Yeah. Thanks. Okay. And um, I want- There is some noise, I think, coming from your microphone somehow. Can you try to- it is. Oh, okay, now, and now it's okay. Someone else is. So we have a last question here from Yuval Kluger from Yale, and then we'll go to the next uh, talk. I have a quick uh, te technical question. So one, uh, I thought that you said that you are doing some type of uh, population spotification uh, before you do the correlation between the SNPs and whatever you want to do. And I wonder if you don't throw away important biological information because, for instance, the HLAs and all those uh, uh, genes could be also uh, ethnicity yeah. dependent. So if you don't yeah. do the correction, you may find much stronger sing signal. And this is something that probably is worth doing it. I don't know what is your comment about that. The second question is also technical. Uh, you show the mysterious uh, kind of signal downstream. And yeah. I wonder I wonder if in, if that region is quite uh, repetitive, and maybe you have uh, issues with uh, correct mapping. Mm -hmm. Okay, that's great. Yeah, so um, I think you're right that it is possible that when we when we add in these principal components as additional things to in our regression models that are attempting to account for ancestry, we're weakening signals. Um, but we do still see, for instance, these MHC effects. Um, and I guess that just is saying that there's enough um, dis there's enough of a disconnect between ancestry and MHC that um, at least we, we may there may be things that we lose completely. And I think it's probably worth going deeper into that. We do still see MHC effects even when we have these um, ancestry terms as additional covariates. So we're not losing it completely. But yeah, I think that thinking harder about how to deal with um, with the, with this ancestry um, and maybe looking at specific things that drop out when you do that. I think that's a really good idea. Yeah, um, right. The region where those, you know, it, it has some of these, several of these zinc finger um, domains. Um, I would need to go back and look more carefully. It didn't look weird, super weird in the way that you're describing in terms of like highly repetitive or something. I mean, you know, it, I mean, obviously these these zinc crab zinc fingers are um, are ex highly expanded, you know, and so there, there are duplications um, uh, of, of that, those genes, that gene family, but, um, yeah, I, I'll look at it. That's a great question. Yeah, yeah. Thank you. Okay. Okay, so thank you very much, Phil, once again. I see that there is one question in the chat that maybe you can answer in the chat and people can also uh, keep on asking questions during uh, our next talk. Yeah, okay. I'll do, do that. To, I don't want to keep somehow times. So let's go to our next speaker. And uh, uh, so, what, what, I have any here? Okay, sorry. Uh, yeah, so Pierre.